Well, we've been doing a series on Sunday mornings on the seven churches of Revelation. We started that um, um, three weeks ago. We introduced the concept of that and how Jesus uh, had a message for the, the uh, churches in Asia Minor. Ethan, you can pop that uh, up there if you like and let them see that, uh, that map again. Um, just in the way of reminder, Asia Minor is, uh, is northeast I'm sorry, north, northwest of um, uh, Israel. You'll see Judea um, below Syria there. You know, Israel's over here on the side on, of the Mediterranean Sea. And you go up, and then you go west, um, which is modern-day Turkey. That big, giant round, or not round, but that peninsula there is, uh, is Turkey in, in our times. But you'll see that that's where they called it Asia. We call it Asia Minor. And, uh, and then where you see where it says Macedonia and Thrace, that's Greece. And then you have Italy, um, which was called Italy back then. So it's kind of easy to know where Italy is. And Italy shaped like a boot, so that's kind of easy too. Amen? Um, but we're going to be uh, talking about these seven churches that Jesus had a message from, to John for seven churches that existed at that time. And each one of them had their positives or negatives or both. And, uh, and they were to be read by the pastor to the church, a letter to each pers- church personally to deal with that. And isn't it a comfort, as we said last week, that we see that Jesus recognizes amongst the universal body of Christ, local church bodies. The Lord delivered that. So the local church is a biblical um, thing that is obviously the will of the Lord, and Jesus is the good shepherd of the church. He's the pastor over all the churches. We're just under shepherds, who he's called. But in in Asia uh, Minor, as you see, um, there's those seven churches. And today, we're going to, if you look up there, you'll see um, up at the northwest uh, of the churches is the church of Pergamon. And we're going to talk to you about the, uh, the church of Pergamum or Pergamos. You hear it called Pergamos sometimes. And so, um, so we're going to get into that today and learn what God has to say to us um, through that church. Because as I said, the pastor read the letter to that church and then the letter was to be passed around. And you'll see that even in this letter, but where he says church is plural, so his intention was clear from when he delivered it, and even within the letters themselves, he says it to that church, but then he speaks it to the churches because he wants it to be read by all seven of the churches, but not just by those seven churches, by the church universal, every church in every community that ever gets to hear the anointed Word of God. And the anointed Word of God brings life. It brings uh, correction. It brings uh, rebuke. It brings um, edification. It brings comfort. And it produces faith. Amen? So, uh, so there's something for us to learn. Well, Pergamos, or, per, or Pergamum, was a town in Mycia on the river Caicus, about 50 miles north of Smyrna, called the greatest city in Asia Minor. Pretty major city. Pergamos had the first temple dedicated to Caesar and was a rabid promoter of the imperial cult. They worshipped Caesar as God, just like they would worship Pharaoh is God. And so you had this imperial cult. The worship of man, of earthly leaders. Do you know <coughs> human beings have been created to worship and so to this day you will still have people who will worship a man or a woman who will worship a leader and believe that they're the Savior. They're the one that's going to fix all things. Um, politicians. Anybody ever... Hear people say, if Donald Trump can get back in the, in the Oval Office, he'll fix everything. He'll save our country. Now, he'll say it more than anybody. <laughs> because he has a lot of confidence. 
And, and that's not a rebuke, that's a fact. And we want people in leadership that have a lot of confidence. Have you heard others say, Barack Obama, if he gets in office, or since he's in office, he is going to save our country. just depends on where your political views are. We'll look to man as if they're going to be the one that can save us. Man's never our Savior. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is Lord, and we need to put our trust in Him. Because how many of you know that some Barack Obama fans, I'm just using him as an example, as a recent, uh, there's currently Joe Biden fans. You just don't have it as prolific, as, as fervent as you did President Obama, because President Biden hasn't been in as long, and we're having a lot of uh, problems in the natural. And so, um, so even Democrats... The majority say they wish he wouldn't be the one running again, but there's really no one else that has risen up they can figure out, so they're just kind of doing that. But they, Barack Obama, President Obama, was beloved. How many of you know that? Charismatic, intelligent, handsome, or, you know, guy that just uh, um, you know, communicated incredible well. You can look back in history to another president like that, Ronald Reagan was called the great communicator. Just had a way, very popular in his day. And then people, um, more modern, love Trump, love Biden, you know. Uh, people will get that and they'll become enthralled with that and they can do no wrong. But how many of you know that open-minded, intelligent people could look at and say, I didn't like everything Ronald Reagan did. I didn't like everything Bill Clinton did. I didn't like everything George Bush the senior did. I didn't like everything that George Bush um, Jr. did. Uh, I didn't like, he wasn't George Bush Jr., you know, you know George the Third. And so um, I, I didn't like everything that uh, Donald Trump did, and I don't like everything that President Biden's doing, because no human is perfect, are they? They're not our saints. And we've got to recognize they're flawed. And they can mess up big time. And if we lift them up on a pedestal, I can tell you what, they can come crashing down from that so fast. And so always put your trust in man. But that was a problem they had. The imperial cult, Caesar is God. Worship Him. Trust in Him. He is the source of our prosperity because of Rome and, and their leadership and everything. There may be some negatives about it, but Rome is such a great empire, it causes all of us to prosper and have culture. Rome embraced the Grecian uh, intellectual and philosophical principles and brought that in and, and, uh, and people just... Um, became enthralled as world empires got bigger and bigger. You kind of think about prophecy and how we talked about the image of Nebuchadnezzar. And each world empire gave place to stronger. They were inferior in one sense, but they were bigger and mightier with each one that came. Rome being that last one. And, uh, and so they just worshipped Caesar and and and. The, the Roman leaders and things that were over them. Um, this is probably why in verse 13, we're going to read, i got to turn to Revelation 2. Uh, get, get over to Revelation 2 to get yourself ready, those of you who have your Bibles with you. I recommend you have your Bible with you. It's, it's good. It's always helpful. Um, you know, whether it's an electronic Bible or whether it's a physical Bible, it's good to turn. Um, we do provide it up there and it's, it works for you. But, um, but in verse 13 of that, and don't, don't put that up just yet, Ethan, but in verse 13 it calls um, Pergamon Satan's seat. And my, that might be because this imperial cult was birthed there. The first temple um, dedicated to Caesar was built there. Okay, and so Jesus calls it Satan's seat. The city also had a temple de dedicated, and I am going to absolutely butcher this, to Asculapius, <laughs> something like that, Asculapius. Um, and that was the god of healing 
whose insignia was the entwined serpent on the staff. This is still the medical symbol to this day. If you ever think that the, the uh, AMA, AMA symbol is the serpent from Moses, no, Satan counterfeits and, counterfeits and corrupts everything. He can't create anything. And he will counterfeit and corrupt the things of God. There was a single serpent put on there where they were being bitten by serpents because of their sin and they had to look to that serpent realizing, I have blown it and, and it was to look in faith and repent. And when they did, they received healing. But it was a pole with a serpent image on that to get them to do that. But then it gets uh, counterfeited and Satan's tries to tell people, well, I'm your healer, and man can heal you, and God can heal you through man and their intervention. And so they made a pole, and they put two serpents on there. Because he is a serpent. Satan, he, he's called a serpent by the Lord as well. And so he's like, I'm just going to double it up. Amen. And it's interesting that in the time of Exodus, when the single serpent was up there, which was a God thing, when Moses is dealing and he has his rod become a serpent, which was the power of God, Pharaoh's people had two serpents up here. So you have a double serpent. Okay. So uh, we see um, Satan is symbolized as a serpent in 2 Corinthians uh, in verse 9 of uh, Revelation 12 and verse 2 of Revelation 20. Well, let's get into this church in this big thriving city where these temples of idolatry, you wonder why it's Satan's seat? you got a temper, temple to Caesar, a temple to man, and you got a temple to whatever that guy, that, the, uh, God a, you know, the God A, whatever, I don't want to try to pronounce it again, uh, to a false god. All of it's idolatry, putting something before God, whether it's man or whether it's false gods, it's all idolatry. And this is the church he's talking to. So you can kind of think of Pergamon as a, um, as a compromising church, and we'll see that Jesus deals with, it, with that. But in Revelation chapter 2, uh, beginning with verse 12, um, it says, And to the angel of the church of Pergamos, write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. That's where I was talking about Satan's seat, where Satan dwells. So Jesus opens up in his addressing of them as we have learned when there's something positive to be able to say, the Lord starts with that positive. That's His pattern consistently. If there's something good to say, the Lord's going to do that. And then He'll deal with the issues that, that we have. And, and how many of you can say, that is the God that I serve? He is loving to me. He is gracious to me. He is forgiving his grace is abundant and made new every day. He is so wonderful. And, and in that atmosphere of His loving me, and me knowing I'm accepted by Him, then He will correct me, chastise me, rebuke me, like a good father will do, and bring that. But it's, but it's love, it's that positive, then He gives that, and, and when He does that, then He'll try to, say the good thing again afterward. We've seen this kind of pattern. But he talks about how um, he's the one who holds the sharp two-edged sword. See, that was a symbol of, of uh, Caesar. And, uh, and so um, Jesus, you know, we'll get into that in a little bit, but Jesus says, I'm the one who holds the real sword of power. <laughs> The, power, the, the sword of Caesar is nothing compared to that. But he, he speaks to that and says where Satan's throne is. And again, this, all of this idolatry and stuff going on is likely to be that. Um, 
But we see that he says three things in that one brief sentence where he says, I know your works, you hold fast to my name, and, and did not deny my faith. And you see how he says, my faith? Because it's, it's not faith in Caesar, it's not faith in that, that a God, you know, whatever his name, <laughs> you know. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce that name, and I'm not going to keep trying it. So in, that, in, in false gods, it's faith in me, my faith, the true faith. That's what matters. And, uh, and so he gives them a, a, condom, a, a, a commendation, you did not deny my faith. Okay? And, uh, and of course, you know, we see um, these things that are pointed out. So let's look at those things very quickly. He said, I know your works. So let's you know, look at that first thing. Works. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Just a reminder. We've talked about this already. We've seen that Jesus recognizes the activities of His followers, of His believers, and He commends those. And we've mentioned that. But um, Ephesians 2.10, just a reminder. For we are His workmanship. He's working on us. He's molding us and fashioning us, and doing something in us. That's the way it works for the true believer. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. He made us, we're His workmanship, He made us, He created us, and then when He made us a new creation, He created us to serve Him. Because if He just wanted us to be with Him, some of us may say, boy, that would have been nice. How many of you had some ups and downs in life? Some hard things happen. We prayed about some hard things happening, challenges that come to people's lives. And if, if He just wanted us to be with Him and sin separate us from Him, the minute we accept Jesus Christ, what could He have done? Rapture! And it'd be like, I accept you, Lord. It's like, okay. And then our natural body dies. And our spirit goes up. It's like, I'm not going to let them go on anymore. <laughs> I'm just going to get them up here. But he doesn't do that. He created us for good works. You know why? Because somebody told you about the Lord. So wouldn't it be good for you to tell somebody else about the Lord? How shall we hear unless somebody tells us the good news? So we're created for works. We're created to do the ministry, to carry on the works of Jesus. And what did He do? He went about doing good, healing everybody, and preaching and teaching the Word. Revealing people uh, to people the love of God, the ability to have a relationship with God, and the principles of God's kingdom. The second thing He says, I, I know that you're, you're holding fast to Christ's name. It can be hard to hang on to the Christian faith in a community like that. We're living in a country, sadly, that is not the country I grew up in. Some of you are old as I am, or older as I am, or close to being as old, and you can remember things like, has anybody in here, if, raise your hand if you recognize the name James Arnett. We were riding to, to, to we were riding to, um, from Peace Valley coming back here, and we were talking, and and I said, so I'll ask you, how many has ever heard of Blockbuster Video? Anybody? How many of you ever rented a video from Blockbuster Video? How many of you heard of Jack Parr? Anybody knows who Jack Parr? Look how few hands. <laughs> He was before, some, some of you may not even know who this guy is, because he's long gone, Johnny Carson. He was before Johnny Carson. How many of you know who Bob Barker is? Monty Hall. Art Linkletter. Some of you are saying, Oh, Pastor, you're reminding me of the good old days when television Television was a little better. Well, I don't know about that. Uh, Johnny Carson was kind of getting a little bit, a little bit rough. I didn't, as once I got saved especially, I didn't watch it. But, um, but we're reminded that, you know, we live and we live and we go on. Um, and it's, it's challenging 
when the pressure's on to hold fast his name. It was easy to be a Christian back then. It was easy to be a minister back then. The profession, of, if the world calls it a profession of being a minister, was respected. It was considered like a white-collar, respected kind of thing. We're like down there with used car salesmen and, and, uh, and lawyers now. Christians are considered haters in our culture today. It's not the country that it was because we're living in last days and men are calling evil good and good evil. Well, how many of you know it's good to be a believer? It's good to follow Christ. Uh, Christians are created to do good works. Be good people. Be good citizens. Be productive. Be a blessing. But people are tolerated, uh, not tolerated for that. In the name of tolerance. We're not tolerated. <laughs> so we're, he's commend, they're commended for holding fast to his name. Think about Ephesians 6.13 when I read that. Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be, be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. We, you know, um, that's what he's commending them for. In the evil day, when the persecution comes, when the trial comes, when the tribulation comes, when you've done everything you can do, stand. The woman with the issue of blood tried everything in the world. She did spent all of her living on doctors trying to get help, and help doesn't come from man. Our went from where does our help come from? Our help comes from the Lord. And so she, having done all, she just stood in faith. She approached Jesus knowing that He could do what the doctors couldn't do. That, that, um, that cult of a God of healing wasn't going to get her healed, but the great healer could help her, and He did. Amen. So holding fast to his name, standing on him. I tell you, when I was going through that, the devil trying to say, well, where is your God now? Where is your healer now? When the first, you know, when the disc ruptured and you're in crippling pain and hurting and, and it's just horrible and they schedule the surgery and then whoops, I sliced the major nerve in your spine by accident. Oh, great. And so, you know, so we go through that and then four outpatient surgeries and Doing all this, you know, sticking giant needles in there and making more scar tissue. He left fragments of the disc. Then you get scheduled for another surgery, and the devil's like, Well, you had the first surgery, and that didn't help. Then you had these outpatient surgeries, and that, that didn't help. You're just getting worse. And now you got to do another one. Where is your God? I didn't listen to that kind of stuff or look to that kind of stuff. I just kept saying, Praise God, I'm healed. And just kept going forward and walking by faith and declaring the word of God. And if a doctor, you know, uh, was able to do give you some kind of help, they're not, you know, I mean, this was a false healing. Don't don't go to some false, you know, you know, psychic healing and stuff. Have you ever seen that kind of stuff? That's of the devil. That's what this was. But a but the doctor with the with the medical license. Although, man, they're getting really bad too. Be careful. Always pray. You know, they can make mistakes. I'm an example. Whoops. And, you know, he come in there. I'm in agony in the hospital room after the surgery. And he come in there just don't understand because they get you to stand up right away you know just stand at first and then I just don't understand why you're hurting so bad well the senior pastor his wife was a surgical nurse in the hospital so she knew and he had told me at you know one time in recovery well you know I'd have been done he well he didn't tell me I shouldn't say me he told my you know Lisa and you know I should have been done an hour and a half ago but on the last cut, I cut the nerve. And you know, and <laughs> that was the last he said. All I know, I'm awake and in the room and in agony. He's like, I just don't understand why you're healing. Because all of a sudden, he's starting to think about 
medical malpractice and stuff like that, because he kind of did that. He's doing a different kind of surgery on me than you normally were supposed to get. He's like, I'm just going to cut a hole in your spine and scrape out all the spinal gel and let your spine... Normally they would fuse <laughs> to connect, to make up the weakness. No, I'm just going to cut it out and make it even weaker. <laughs> let your whole spine sit on that thing. Well, so much for the hydraulic system. And so he's already doing that, and, and then he makes a mistake. We've got to trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Don't deny the faith. And then the third thing, or I'm sorry, the, uh, uh, hold fast to Christ's name. Trust in Him. And then the third thing, don't deny the faith. When the pressure gets on, when the devil's trying to get you to just throw up hands and quit, oh, it just, you know, you just can't keep it up. It's too hard to be a believer. It's too difficult. People are giving it, making it too difficult for you at work or whatever. Whatever the cost. I have had um, situations where my faith was, uh, by standing on that, put me in a position to to bring great cost. I'm not going to give it some examples because we just don't have time. But, you know, but this will happen if you do this and make that stand. And, and, uh, and the Lord delivered me every time. He would be my redemption. He would do that. But whatever the cost, you know, if I give up a promotion, if I give up a raise, if I don't get accepted in the click of, you know, being with the, the world, doing the worldly things with them so that I can be in, you know, um, that's just so be it. I'm going to declare the name of the Lord. Amen? And then um, uh, we see that. Don't deny that faith. So, so I, I didn't read the scripture, 1 Timothy 5 eight. but if anyone does not pride for, provide for his own, and especially for those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. If you're not following the Lord and doing what He said to do, following His leadership and His principles and, and, and letting Him... Uh, work in you because when he's working in you, that's what you do. <laughs> then, then you're worse than an unbeliever. You've denied the faith. What faith? His kingdom principles. Faith in Jesus. Because Jesus doesn't say, ah, don't take care of your kids. Put you first. But this world's telling us to put me first. So much so that people are killing their babies. I can't raise a baby. I can't do that. And, and, and now they don't say it should be safe, rare, and legal. Now they say, celebrate your abortion. Famous comedian and actress, a comedic actress, said, oh, I just wish I had an abortion. I wish I would have had an abortion. Because she couldn't celebrate an abortion because she didn't have one. So she wishes she had one. What? What? What a, you know. <laughs> and that brings me to the next verses here. Where, where did we leave off first? Uh, uh, I got notes there. And, um, is it 13 or 14? My name and faithful. Verse 14, but I have a few things against you. So there's the commendation. I have a few things against you. Now this is real serious. Listen to this. Because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. And we've talked about that. And that's the first thing that civilizations and, and it happens is these false gods. I, re, I refer to Jonathan Kahn and you can kind of listen to some of his recent um, interviews and the book that he has recently released and, you know, and, and get some understanding of what that is. Or actually, I think it's a video. I'm not sure. Um, but... Uh, that you hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you have, all, thus you have those who hold... Am I reading in the right place? Okay. Thus you have also you hold the doc, those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I also hate. Jesus hates false teaching. He hates the tolerating and accepting the worship. Our church, our modern church, is embracing sexual immorality. 
the doctrines of Balaam, uh, not the family, the, the way that God created with one man and one woman in faithful monogamous marriage, in a commitment to one another, raising their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It's a selfish society, and it's, you know, it's, you know, don't need to get married, and it's, just, and it's no different, uh, you know, statistically amongst people in the church as it is, you know, I mean, relatively speaking, as far as um, having babies outside of marriage and different things like that, um, because it's tolerated. It's, it's not... It's not condemned. You, you have amongst you those who are doing that. Remember the, the issue Paul had with Corinth and how a guy was sleeping with his stepmother. And they just had him as part of the church. And it's like, ah, let's not worry about that. That's the modern church. That don't, that don't preach sin. Don't, don't say some things are wrong. It's okay. They, they say they love Jesus, and that's the world. And what's the world doing? They're having this doctrine of Balaam and sexual immorality, and there's bring, it's bringing that in, and you have whole denominations that are embracing the whole LGBT+, plus, 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 dollar sign and percent, everything. Things that God said are not right. You know, all of that, but just the sexual immorality itself. Between that or outside of that, it's just as wrong, just as bad. Preachers doing it, congregants doing it. And, uh, and it's opening the door for various things. They, they committed idolatry. They were looking to other things. They, it opened the door. See, we remember the story, I even talked about that recently, um, of Balaam and how Balaam, you know, was to prophesy and, and Balak was um, telling him to do this. And he, he wasn't going to do it, but then he offered him a lot of money. He's like, I'll do it, but the Lord wouldn't let him do it. He's like, hey, I'll, I'll try. This money sounds good. I'll try. So each place he went, and then, you know, the donkey remembered the whole story. And, and God never did let him prophesy against Israel. He blessed them. But because of what he did, it corrupted Israel. And the door became open. And Balaam got in. And idolatry, sexual immorality, unholiness came in to the people of God. Balak wanted to just have a military defeat, but Satan had the ultimate defeat. And that's why God hates that. And that spirit of Balaam still in, in here today to bring corruption to the church. Acceptance. And oh, that's love and just this and this and this. No, what's the word say? And then of course we already talked about the, de the deeds of the Nicolaitans and all of that in, in the church of Ephesus and and he said, I hate these things. So God doesn't accept watered down Christianity, watered down doctrine. He wants the whole counsel of God preached and proclaimed and for us to follow His will, His perfect will. Now I told you to think about how He's the one who holds the sword um, in, you know, uh, in verse 12. Um, that's the Lord's description of Himself. I'm the one who holds uh, you know, the two-edged sword. Um, that was in contrast to the sword of the Roman proconsul, who um, they would call it Caesar's sword. It was man's power. And, uh, and, and so in verse 16, did we get there? Let me see, get to verse 16. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. To the believers, he's saying, Repent, stop tolerating this. And we talked about the need that we're called to repent. That's another one of those things that Balaam tries to bring in. Oh, we don't need to repent. Don't talk about sin. We're, no, Christians don't have to repent. We're already forgiven. We're already washed in the blood, so we don't have a need to repent. Well, that's not what the Word says. Is Jesus talking? Is this a letter of importance to be read to the church? Is He telling the believers... Who, are, who have kind of been accepting this, mix it in with the church, to t tolerating these things. Um, 
Is he saying to them to repent? Or it's okay, just go with it. As long as you love me, acknowledge me. That's all that matters. No. He's saying repent. And he says, but I will fight against them, the ones who are doing these things and have not and are denying me. You haven't denied me. So far you've been hanging on. But you mixing this in, they'll corrupt you. So repent. You're going the wrong direction. Repent means to do a 180, to turn around and go the other direction. Stop doing that. It, it, it will corrupt you. And so he says, I'll fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So, so it's more important to trust in the sword of the Lord <laughs> than, and, and then be fearing the sword of man. So there's four things that he condemns, you know, um, holding the doctrine of Balaam, eating things sacrificed to idols, committing fornication, and then holding the doctrines of the Nicolaitans. We see all this. And, uh, and I could read some scriptures, Ethan, but you'll just kind of follow with me. I'm going to skip down a little bit, but he says repent, change directions. And uh, I've got several scriptures on there, but... Um, well, let me just give you a couple. I've got... No, I don't have a couple minutes. I'm out. Out of time. <laughs> um, but, but repentance is a biblical principle. Um, then go down to Hebrews uh, 6, 4, and 6. I'm going to skip over uh, Joshua 23. And, and uh, it says, for those, It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Does that describe believers to anybody in here? Enlightened, the light has turned on, you are spiritually illuminated because God has come in. We were blind, but now we see. Um, we've tasted of the heavenly gift, the gift of eternal life. We've become ta partakers of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God dwells in us. We've partaken of that. Is that describing a believer to you? Tasted of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come. We, we, were, we were feeding on the Word, living by the Word, following the, following the Word. That's believers, right? It's impossible for people, believers, can we say that? For believers? Is that just describing believers? It's impossible for believers, verse 6, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they've crucified again for themselves the Son of God and put Him to an open shame. See, if we deny the Lord and we turn back from Him, having tasted of His goodness, filled with His Spirit, living for Him, and then we deny Him and say, God's not real. God's, God, he, He's, you know, he, he, I'm an atheist. I, I was just fooled. It's just, you know, a cult like anything else. Christianity, there are people who do that sort of thing. Tasted of things. Reject God. Deny Christ. And, and it says it's impossible for them to fall away. Now, you've got to get a long way away. Some scholars say that they believe that that was the Jewish people who had accepted all of the benefits of, of grace and what New Covenant brought in and got filled with the Holy Spirit and, you know, and, and, and have all that. And then they deny that and they turn back to a, a, a religion that, that brought Jesus to them and then they denied it. And the impossible isn't anything's impossible with God, but it's impossible with them because they'll never turn back. He knows. There are some people who have done that that will close up and harden their heart. They'll never repent. You say, well, what if I just kind of missed the mark? I remember when I thought I committed the unpartable sin, you know, sinned against the Holy Spirit. Have I done that? You know how I stop that? If I'm going to go to hell, Satan... So be it. But I'm going to tell you what, I'm not going to give up and join you. If I've committed the unpardonable sin, he used to do that to me when I was a young Christian. How many of you had him do that number on you? It's like, if I've done it, you know he backed off after I got this revelation. If I've done it, you know what I said, Connie? I said, I am going to preach Jesus more. I'm going to share the gospel more. I'm going to tell people the good news more. I'm going to warn people of the age to come and judgment and everything else to repent and accept Jesus Christ. I'm going to get as many people to not go to hell, even if I have to go to hell. I'm going to get as many people to not have to go there with me. The devil said, well, I've lost this one. 
And he backed off. And what I've come to learn and tell people is if you're sitting there feeling concerned, what if I've committed a part of the Lord? I don't want to. Your heart is not hardened to God. It's so soft to God. It's like, Lord, I want to be with you. I want to go to heaven. I want to live for you. And the good news is you ain't there. You have not got close to being there. And he is faithful and just when you just repent of whatever sin you did to. He's faithful and just to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And his blood continues to be applied. And we walk in faith and and we're going to go to heaven. We shared that on Wednesday night. Or was it last Sunday? I don't know which. 1 John 5.13, these things have I written to you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Not wish, not hope. You know. Hallelujah. Isn't God good? And here's the promise. We always say we want to emphasize the promise. I have went over. But let me tell you the promise. Uh, I closed my book. Let me go down in my notes. Revelation 2.17 says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. We get to try out that manna we've read about. We've wondered, was that stuff good? You know, how did those Israelites... Get to the point where they're like, manna again. They tried everything. They could to get creative with it. They ate manna straight. They ate manna sandwiches. They, they made the manna bread. They had manna cotti. They did everything they could with that manna and, did, and, and they just got bored with it and started to complain. The oh Lord, He's so good to us. He sends them quail, gives them some meat to go, make some manna sandwiches, put quail in there, do that, whatever you got to do. But... But we get to try it, and we're going to be like, what was wrong with those fools? This is the best bread I've ever ate. This is the best stuff I've ever ate. And we get to eat some of it, get to try it. But this is what I want to, i got to go, but I want you to think about this. I want you to get excited about this. This is one of my favorite to him who overcomes things. I'm so glad I'm glad I get the crown of righteousness, crowns and rewards and all of that. But I'm going to throw that stuff on the ground before him when I worship him. But he is going to give you and me who overcome, who stay steadfast to the end, he's going to give us a white stone and it's going to have a name on it, a name that he names us, a special nickname that he has for just you, a special pet name. That when he thinks about you, that's the name that comes to mind. And he's going to write it on there. And only you and he get to know it. It's just for you. And you'd be like, oh God. Oh, you fit that. And he'd be like, oh, oh, how he loves you and me. And you're going to have that name. You know, they knew when that letter was written what that was. Because back then in that culture, the white stone was called a victory stone. And they, it, they would give it to someone who, uh, in a trial, you would either get a black stone or a white stone. The white stone was not guilty. You overcame the charge and you are set free. We get a white stone that says, I'm saved. I belong to Him. He has my name. My new name. And I belong to Him. I have the victory. I've overcome the world. And the white stone, the victory stone, not only was used in court things, but it was used in those games that they had. And someone who won the game was provided and had provision for the rest of their life. The, you know, living off the taxpayers. They had everything provided for the rest of their life. He is our provider he takes care of us until we get up there and get that name. You got a new name. And you're going to get to see it. So you're not only going to have a new home, you're going to have a new name. And I can't wait to hear it. You got a pet name for your wife, for your husband, for your kids. My wife's name is wife. People hear me, it's like, man, that's almost as bad as old lady. It's like, no, wife meant 
when I would look at her, I was in awe and I said, this is my wife. So it became my name for her. To this day, I call her wife. I don't say Lisa on the birthday cards, anniversary cards, mother, what, you know, all that stuff. It says wife. She's my treasure. She's my wife. My gift. We had a dinky. Michelle was dinky. <laughs> and, you know, and, and then Michelle has a, a, a girl that was small like her, Emily, and she's Biddy. So we had Dinky, and then Dinky had Biddy. How many of you done that kind of thing? You have a peanut, you have a tiger, you have a bow, <laughs> whatever. He's got a name for you and me. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for that. Thank you for knowing that we can know we have the gift of eternal life. We are going to be uh, doing what the, that church was commended for. We are going to hold fast to the faith. We are going to stand no matter what goes on in this life. Having done all, we will stand. We will never deny you. We will love you. We will follow you. We will, we will uh, pursue you. And Lord, we will do the things you've called us to do. Show us what you want us to do. And we will do those good works, that service to you reaching others, serving you, and we look forward to the life we have in the days ahead with you here on this earth. But Lord, we are excited about when that trumpet sounds and you call us home. Oh, we're so ready. Even so, as John says at the end of the book of Revelation, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We love you. We worship you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.